We continue in the book of Leviticus as we learn more about the offerings and all of the things surrounding them. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Henry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Great to have you along with us as we discover and learn about the Bible. One of the ways we do that is what Corey does. Corey, what's up? We're going to be taking a look at unacceptable sacrifices today. There's a lot of talk about acceptable and unacceptable sacrifices in Leviticus, and we're focusing in on the negative there. I look forward to hearing that, Corey. That'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. And what did you do today? Today we're going to talk about Thanksgiving offerings. All right, very good. These are There are many different kinds of offerings that tell mm -hmm. us about God. That's good. Ryan is up. Ryan, what's up? Today's reading includes the ordination of Aaron along with his sons into the priesthood. And so I'm going to be examining the life of this man. All right, that's good. Now we're looking at offerings part two, Leviticus chapter five to chapter eight. We're going to read from chapter seven, beginning with verse one. Leviticus chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Likewise, this is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, they shall kill the trespass offering. And its blood he shall sprinkle all around on the altar. And he shall offer from it all its fat. The fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys he shall remove. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a trespass offering. Every male among the priests may eat it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. The trespass offering is like the sin offering, there is one law for them both. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. And the priest who offers anyone's burnt offering, that priest shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has offered. Also every grain offering that is baked in the oven and all that is prepared in the covered pan or in a pan shall be the priests who offers it. Every grain offering whether mixed with oil or dry, shall belong to all the sons of Aaron, to one as much as the other. Leviticus chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. You know, the book of Leviticus is interesting because we talk about offerings. Now, when I talk about offerings, I'm talking about offerings to God. They were to be presented in a, a certain way. They were to be sacrificed in a, a certain way. In fact, each offering had specific plans. They had set in place these plans around them to make sure that they were given in the way which the Lord had commanded. Now, some would say this is information we don't really need to know now because we don't kill animals anymore for the Lord. But the truth is that we use this information to learn how God dictated the offerings to be given. God is detailed about the way in which we, we make offerings and offerings are made and what they're for. The trespass offering was one of the most holy. This is interesting. The priests were the ones required to separate all of the internal organs of that offering and to burn them according to what the Lord had said. We would be wise to pay attention to the offerings of God and not to use it like we want to, but use it according to what the Lord has said. We learn that the funds of God's offerings are not to be misused in any way when we consider today's offerings and today's tithes. Now it's important because many people give with stipulations. I'll give to that organization if they do that. I'll give to this organization if they do that. Those are stipulations on offerings. God's offerings are different. We give to the Lord because the Lord has done so much for us. If you have your Bible guide, turn in today's, and this is the Bible guide, by the way, if you don't have yours, why not? You can write to us and use the addresses on the bottom of the screen. We'd love to send them to you. Turn to today's page, which is interesting. It's page 34, and it talks about offerings. Offerings part two. 
And as we study Leviticus chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, we pray that, Father, you would come in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would help us to learn and to know and to understand exactly what it is that we need to hear about this offering. Now, this is important, God, because we need to know what is it that we need to do? How, how do we need to change our thinking? So help us, Father, to understand this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. With that in mind, we turn our attention towards Leviticus chapter 7, and we learn this. Likewise, verse 1, this is the law of trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, they shall kill the trespass offering. Similar to the burnt offering, interesting. And its blood shall be sprinkled all around the altar, and he shall offer it from all of its fat. And the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a trespass offering. Now, this is fascinating because we look at the first point. Listen, God expected the priest to learn and be skilled at burning the offering. The priest was to, to have a skill in this area. Now, listen carefully. We should pay attention to what offerings are for and use them, priest, according to what God has said. We must use the offerings according to what God has said. You know, offerings are not for us to have money. That's not why they're there. Now, we are to take what we need. Need is a very interesting word because there's what we want, but then there's what we need. As pastors and, and church leaders, we need to take what we need, and then God will do the rest. But offerings are designed to help us to build the kingdom of God. And as we build the kingdom of God, God uses it. Now, this is interesting because we go to verse, or chapter 7, verse 6. It says, listen, every male among the priest may eat it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. The trespass offering is like the sin offering. There is one law for them both. The priest who makes the atonement with it shall have it. Now, that's fascinating because our second point, this is really important. God expects us to understand that we should use the offerings for, what we should use the offerings for. So an offering is given for a reason. We must not use the offerings for anything we want. We want, but instead, we must consider what God desires. Beloved, God gives offerings and encourages people to give offerings for reasons. And so we need to do that. We need to pay attention to those reasons and listen to what God does. Today, I think our offerings are so messed up that it's incredible. We just give here and give there, but we need to think about this. We're giving because the Lord has taught us and we want to express our great appreciation to Jesus Christ. Very important. Well, chapter seven, verse eight continues. Look at this. And the priest, the priest who offers anyone's burnt offering that priest shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has offered. Also, every grain offering that is baked in the oven and all that is prepared in the covered pan or in a pan shall be the priest who offers it. Every grain offering, whether mixed with oil, whether it's dry, shall belong to all the sons of Aaron to one as much as the other. Now, God is very specific in saying this. Camera, th or, uh, or rather uh, point three, God explains that the grain offering should be used for the priest for food. The workers of God are sustained by offerings and it is their food, sustained by people who have given. But we don't sustain ourselves by things we want, but we choose the things we need and we pray that the Lord would help us. Now, I pastored for many years, and I tell you that it was really good because I chose my offerings carefully and all of that, 
But you know, people would give me things. And you know, what I learned is when somebody gives you something, you can't give it away. So that's what I learned. And so God is giving things and God will give you things through people. And they say, I want to give this to you. So you have no choice but to accept it. That's very important as, as believers, as priests, and as people who live in the faith, the household of faith. As we continue on in our study of Leviticus, I want to focus in specifically on chapter 8 and specifically on Aaron. It's here that he is ordinated as Israel's very first high priest. But unlike his younger brother Moses, Aaron grew up as a Hebrew citizen in the midst of Israel's 400-year period of slavery in Egypt. It was not a good time for Israel. But Aaron and Moses, through God, would bring the people out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. Though he was born in the prosperous nation of Egypt, as a Hebrew, his life would be full of toils and hardships. Indeed, Aaron was born during Israel's 400-year period of slavery in Egypt. Although his infant brother Moses got passed off as an Egyptian and grew up in the royal palace, Aaron would not be quite so privileged. Still, despite these two very different upbringings, in time, the two brothers' paths would once again converge. And it would be with the same purpose of mind, to free the Hebrew people from their Egyptian captors and deliver them to their promised land. It was a plan orchestrated by God himself, who instructed the now 83-year-old Aaron to go meet his now 80-year-old brother in the wilderness. By this time, Moses had fled from Egypt after killing an Egyptian and had lived in Midian for 40 years. It had been a long wait, but the time had finally come to break the bonds of slavery off of Israel. So God commissioned Aaron and Moses to confront Pharaoh and free their people. Moses would lead the operation, but Aaron was Moses' mouthpiece. In fact, not only did Aaron address Pharaoh on behalf of Yahweh, but he also performed signs and enacted the plagues. Throughout the Exodus and wilderness wanderings, Aaron would remain in a leadership role, second only to Moses. Actually, Aaron would later be established by God as Israel's very first high priest, and his descendants would carry on in this holy service. Unfortunately, Aaron also had some moral failings. The most significant of these occurred during Moses' 40-day encounter with God on Mount Sinai, where he received the Ten Commandments. With Moses gone so long, the people feared that he and God had abandoned them. So they said to Aaron, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Tragically, Aaron submits to their plea and molds a golden calf, at which the people proclaim, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron's rebellion against Moses is another significant moral failure. Significantly, while both Aaron and their sister Miriam speak against Moses, only Miriam is struck with leprosy. Since Aaron was the high priest, leprosy, which would make him unclean and unfit for temple service, would have been a serious penalty. Indeed, Aaron and sons all served as priests before God, though his sons Nadab and Abihu were killed by God for offering impure fire. Unfortunately, Aaron would also die prematurely. In fact, for Moses and Aaron's error at Kadesh, neither of them would be granted entry into the Promised Land. As per God's instructions, Aaron climbed Mount Hor, where Moses removed his priestly garments and put them on Eleazar, Aaron's oldest surviving son. It was upon this mount where Aaron died at the age of 123. You know, every time I read about Aaron molding the golden calf, I just can't believe it. I know Moses had been gone for many, many days, and it was a stressful situation, but it still amazes me. But what's even more amazing is that God forgives Aaron and even anoints him as Israel's very first high priest, as we read about in today's passage. And God even establishes his future descendants as priests as well. That's incredible. God truly is a merciful and gracious God. For me, this account really brings assurance that you've never gone too far and you've never done too much to come back to God. 
The Bible records many foul ups, bleeps, and blunders, and yet God is always there, ready and willing to forgive those that ask him. It's the same today. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's my prayer that we all do that today. Corey, what are you studying today? Yes, Ryan, today I'm going to be taking a look at uh, unacceptable sacrifices that are listed in Leviticus. As we read through this Old Testament book of Leviticus, you're going to notice a lot of sacrifices being mentioned and offerings being mentioned. But you also, we, we run into lists of things that are unacceptable to offer to God. And a huge category of unacceptable offerings to God uh, were human sacrifices, of course. But more specifically today, you and I are going to be focusing in on ancient child sacrifice. The issue of human child sacrifice is brought up early on in the Bible. In the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God specifically outlaws child sacrifice three times. In Leviticus 18, the practice is interestingly listed among the sexual sins, sins that are against God's purposes for the family. In Leviticus 20, it's listed in the religious sins, sins that are against God's nature and seen as religious adultery or cheating. And in Deuteronomy 12, it's given as an example to show how terrible the cultures living in Canaan were. They even did what should be unthinkable, killing children for their own advantage. And that is what history reveals as a main goal of child sacrifice, to get a spiritual advantage or favor. Greek historians writing in the 3rd to 1st centuries BC speak of child sacrifice having been brought to them in ancient times by the Phoenicians that it was utilized to try and secure the favor of a god. A vow would be made, if you do this for me, I will sacrifice my child. And then the child would be sacrificed as a show of good faith. Although sometimes the child was sacrificed after the god had given the favor. Mass child sacrifice could also be employed if the city faced something on a broad scale, like defeat in battle. The historians also hint at loopholes, how the wealthy had been known to purchase children from the poor to sacrifice, or how some used child sacrifice to get rid of unwanted children or children with disabilities. The method of sacrifice is described as placing the children on a statue of a god with sloped arms, off of which the child would roll into a pit of fire, while music was played to drown out any crying although it is unclear whether the children were first slaughtered and then burned, or if the method of death itself was the pit of fire. This bears striking resemblance to the biblical descriptions of Canaanite child sacrifice to Molech as passing children through the fire. In 1921, the largest child sacrifice burial ground so far was discovered, containing the cremated remains of over 20,000 children, ranging in age from newborn to six years old. So there we have it, an Old Testament principle that has become so ingrained into Christianity that we just take it for granted that obviously child sacrifice is wrong and, and this, this valuing human life and this valuing human innocence. Um, but you know, in the Old Testament world, it, it, and, and even sometimes in our world when we're paying attention, we don't value life as much as God does, as much as we should. We don't respect uh, the maker of life as much as we should. And in, in this Old Testament time period, uh, the, the Israelites were about to go into a place that practiced child sacrifice quite often. So God, you know, legislating this culture and making it very obvious to everyone uh, it was a very important step in Israel's constitution, if you will, as they go through, this is their law now. They know without a shadow of a doubt that this is wrong and it's completely unacceptable. And in a few more programs, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about this because later on in Israel's history, unfortunately, there were some kings of Israel and some people of Israel who slipped into this practice. Apparently it was very, um, you know, it, it was able to, to draw people in and it was for some reason very attractive. Um, so we're going to be talking more about this on, on programs in the future. But for now, we see this outline that God just, without a shadow of a doubt, this is wrong. Human sacrifice and human child sacrifice. The question is, that really, you ask the question um, when you see this and read the subject. And it's in the Bible. The Bible is, you know, ancient. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's truthful. And it's God's word. And in the Bible, they talk about the worship of Chemosh. Yep. Offering their sons to the fires of Chemosh. And Molech. Mm -hmm. And Molech, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and there's several gods. Now the question is, 
where did all that come from? And mm. we speculate that uh, it comes from Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. which is after the flood, but it's the Tower of Babel when the languages were confused and man reached for God and came up with this idea somehow through the demonic forces or whatever. Mm -hmm. You gotta kill somebody to make the gods mm -hmm. happy. Well, kill I mean, somebody. And I mean, it's not, it's not too much of a stretch from animal sacrifice. That's so right. When, when you're yeah. looking at how God instituted mm -hmm. animal sacrifice, um, you know, with Adam and Eve and then, and then with Cain and Abel. And, and so you can see how human nature is like, well, I need more power than that. I'm desperate. So what, mm -hmm. how am I going to one up this? Yeah. And you know, one upping God's idea is mm -hmm. never a good idea, mm -hmm. but, 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 you know, it, it seems the ancient people believed for whatever reason that this did give them some spiritual power. And I'm definitely willing to admit that in some cases it was likely convenience, you know, having mm. too many children might, might well, be yeah. inconvenient, but not in every case. It doesn't explain the widespread um, kind of mania ar around this. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not too far of a stretch to speculate that they saw some sort yeah. of return mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. for their like for their, investment, yeah. um, which is a terrible thing to say. But again, the destruction of human life. Human life yeah. is different than animal life. Animal life was created. Human life was created, but God blew into human life His spirit. Mm -hmm. So a human being is an offspring of God. Mm -hmm. Even your worst enemy, you know, is an offspring of God. Mm -hmm. We are created in the image of God, human beings. Mm -hmm. And so that is very important. Today, uh, a lot of the animal groups are putting together humans and animals. But, the, you know, if you don't believe in God, you understand how they make that connection. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it's not the case. Yeah. And that's what they did. Yeah, and I think it's, I think it's really interesting to go back to what, what is God saying is acceptable to him, to offer to him. And animal sacrifice was acceptable to him. It was a way of reminding you of the seriousness of your mm -hmm. sin. Child sacrifice, no way. That was a step too far. And when you read in ancient documents, it appears as if, it appears as if every time when child sacrifice is, is talked about, it appears more about a power thing. When you, mm. when you need yeah, people spiritual are trying power, to get power, when mm. you need victory in war, when yeah. you're desperate, it, it's, it's like they think, okay, well, if I just sacrifice this, then I'll get all this spiritual power. But God's like, get, uh, sacrifices aren't about getting spiritual power. Jesus Christ yeah. made the sacrifice and, and we don't sacrifice animals anymore because Jesus Christ made the final sacrifice. Mm. Something that we need to make yeah. clear. Well, and, and, and going further with that is, is the idea that when you can see what the other cultures were doing, yeah. all of a sudden now, when you're talking about reading through Leviticus, where people say, oh, God is just so angry. He's all about blood. He's all about death. It was a very different ritual. And it mm -hmm. wasn't just go out and slaughter the animals. There were very many specifics. We're reading about them right now. Directions and instructions that needed to be followed explicitly before God, mm -hmm. putting him in the, in the proper holiness, not like the other gods that you could just do, the more that you could do or the more mm. frenzied that you would get, the more that you could get in return. And that's not the love of the Father. That's not the order and the instruction of God. And so I think that's a, a very good um, lesson for all of us to mm -hmm. learn is the cultures that were around in that time that were so very much different. And God was setting apart his yeah. chosen people. He was setting the example for them mm -hmm. as their God so that they would be different mm -hmm. from the rest of the culture. And so Jesus Christ calls us to the same in our world today. We are set apart. If we follow Jesus Christ, then we're not following the frenzy of our culture because a lot of what our culture does is not what Jesus would do mm -hmm. and is not what Jesus taught. And so these reasons are why we study the whole Bible because what is written all these thousands of years ago that may not, you think, apply to us now, certainly do mm -hmm. because it's, it, we need to understand why it's written 
and the culture that it was written to. And just very quickly in my portion, because I know you want to talk about something at the end as well, it was talking about Thanksgiving offerings, and we were reading about them in our readings today in Leviticus chapter 7. The law of peace offerings says, this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer to the Lord. If he offers it for a Thanksgiving, then he shall offer, and it goes on to describe it. Thanksgiving offerings were typically associated with a song of joy, which I love that idea because I love to sing and I love music. This was the response of answered prayer and a proclamation to others of God's goodness. We can see an example of that in Psalm chapter 69. Very quickly, I'm going to start at verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Listen to this verse. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your hearts shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. This is an example. The worshiper in similar fashion was generous towards others by sharing his meal with the guests because uh, a a three-part grain offering was also extended here. And so everyone was to enjoy this Thanksgiving offering. And I thought, how much like we today, when God answers prayer, when we want to offer an, an offering of Thanksgiving to God, it's an example. It's an example to the people around us that God is good and that God answers prayer. And we can celebrate in that. It's a great testimony. And you know, celebration is the key. We can celebrate in that. And that's exactly what we're talking about this time. As we go through Leviticus, we're celebrating and we, that's why we give offerings and we need to pay attention to that because that's exactly what the Lord wanted to do. Remember this, the January guide is here, February, very soon in a couple of days, if you don't already have yours. But what we put in here is today's prayer. And the prayer today is, I'm going to read this for you. Lord, help me to learn to listen to your word. Help me to learn to listen to your word. I want to hear what you are saying, and I want to do it. (laughs) That is a great prayer for today.